So Terry, thank you for having a nice cup of tea. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. So Terry, um, in the community, I think you are well known and loved, uh, in particular for the way that you represent the marriage of contemplation and action. Could you, could you begin by telling us a little bit about how you came to meditation yourself and what you're what you're doing, what, what path of life you've been following. Yeah, you're right. I, I think I'm, I'm very taken by, you know, WCCM's logo of the two doves on the chalice, because for me, it embodies everything about doing our own inner healing through our meditative practice. Um, because from that place of inner healing, I think there's a natural outpouring of compassion and i think because we've all got a sphere of influence i think it's important that we share within our own spheres because we're all different aren't we um, and and share with with the people who we work alongside of um, which in my case happens to be people who tend to be um, on the margins of society you know they might be homeless or might might have mental health problems or drug addiction um, or more recently, over the last few years, um, asylum seekers, um, all of which uh, are on the very margins of society. Uh, so I don't think I could do the work that I do, to be honest, if I didn't have my own practice, um, because it, it, it helps to centre me when I lose my centre. And, and I do lose my centre. So, you know, some, some days, if, if the work is particularly harrowing, you know, without that, knowing that I'm, I'm going to enter that space of, of calm again. You know, whenever I meditate, it's like, and, and as meditators within a community, I can use language like this. It's like we do come home to ourselves. We, you know, there is this oasis of calm and it's within ourselves. Um, you know, and the mantra, I believe, is like a, that radar beep that guides us home to ourselves. Um, so yeah, I've, I've always been interested in social justice, Lawrence. Ever since I was a, a young lad, I remember reading uh, um, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, and I, I, there was something inside of me that was fired up. I just thought, this is wrong. This is wrong. Something needs to be done. And I, I think I've always had that kind of fire in my belly, if you like, to, to speak up for the marginalised and, and to, to not allow the, you know, the so-called powers that be to walk over people. And, you know, I like Meditatio in as much as it's an outreach aspect of WCCM. And it's people like myself and, and other great people working in their fields who are articulating a contemplative voice in the secular world and bringing phrases such as compassion into discussions about allocating funding. You know, I was at a Zoom meeting this morning, for instance, there's some money gonna to come to Teesside and it's an opportunity to develop grassroots social action and, and to extend the kind of um, community work that's been going on through this pandemic. Because th there has been this rising within individual communities of people who, who want to look out for the, the most vulnerable in that community. Um, and opportunities are coming now in terms of funding to allocate money to to be able to properly manage this work going forward as we kind of creep out of this pandemic let's not lose the spirit of community that has risen up within you know these last few months let's make sure that we do look out for our most vulnerable because any society should be judged by how it looks after the weakest members of its communities. 
Um, and that excites me. You know, I, I like that aspect. So I, part of my work is to work one-to-one -one or in groups with, with people on the so-called margins. But another aspect of my work is to be a prophetic voice, if you like, to have the courage to speak truth to power in whatever way. And that might be with commissioners, it might be with the police, it might be with the local authorities, you know, or politicians. But we need to make sure that people aren't forgotten about, people at the bottom of the pile, so to speak, aren't forgotten about. And we've seen a lot of that, you know, through this pandemic. You know, one of the phrases I heard was, it's like um, apartheid. You know, there are some people who are cruising through these months because they're comfortable, they've got good internet access, that you know, they've got a nice garden or they've got a nice park. But there are other people who are herded together, living in, in difficult uh, situations, who mightn't have access to social media, um, who are really struggling. So, you know, that there's, I believe our community has a role to play both in raising people's consciousness through our contemplative practice, but also being a prophetic voice. And if that is primarily Meditatio's work, as opposed to WCCM, or if there is that distinction, you know, I think both can overlap. But yeah. Yeah, thank Still you. Who on the chalice? No, thank you, Terry. That's, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't, I think the Meditatio and the, uh, and WCCM, they're one thing. I yeah. mean, it's, uh, the overlap between the inreach and the outreach is a little uh, abstract in a way, um, uh, but there are certainly programs or and individuals like yourself, you know, who are more explicitly and obviously involved in in the outreach. We're not preaching to the converted. Uh, it's not so, it's not so related to an explicitly Christian. Uh, identity or, or evangelization, but I think it's all essentially it's all one. I mean, they're, they're, they're even institutionally, they're the same thing. Yes. One thing, the question I, w I wanted to ask you was that when I visited you a couple of years ago and spent a little time up in Middlesbrough with you, we went for a walk in this very kind of wasteland area around the center where, mm -hmm. where you work. And we didn't get very far because we met, met somebody that you knew or who knew you and they were, they were homeless and uh, realized that they were, had nowhere to stay that night and had, hadn't had anything to eat. So we turned back uh, in our little walk and went, went back to the center where you got some, him something to eat. And I thought uh, your daily life working in that way with people in immediate physical need as well as maybe great psychological upset, can be very un, unpredictable. How do you balance that uh, level of um, chaos almost, or of spontaneity, maybe another word, uh, which comes out of, for you, is clearly driven by compassion. But how do you reconcile that kind of spontaneity or chaos or unpredictability with the, the regularity and the, the, the rhythm of, of meditation as a, as a contemplative practice and as part of daily life. Yeah, I, I remember that, that day well, Lawrence. And I, th I think you said afterwards, was that stage managed, you know, when we bumped into him? But it, but it wasn't. It, 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 it is, as you say, it, it, it just is. You know, we walk around, uh, we walked around a particular estate, which you know, alongside of Tower Hamlets in London, you know, tops all the indices for poverty and homelessness and prostitution and what have you. And it, it's right in the heart of the town centre in Middlesbrough, as you saw, in the John Paul Centre, you know, where we were working from. And, and you're right, you know, I think John Lennon said something like, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Mm. So 
there we were, you know, I wanted to show you around the estate, if you like, and, and just for you to get a feel for how some people are, are living. Because I know you've walked around the favelas of Rio and, and different places. And I know that you, you are passionate about how meditation can build community. So how can meditation work in communities that are fractured, not just with people who are damaged, but how can meditation play its part in building community? So you're right. I, I think the advantage of meditation is that it gives me uh, a way, like I said before, of recentering when I lose my center. And I think the more centered I am, the more resilient I become in light of difficult situations that, that I come across, in, you know, in work settings. Um, you know, I think meditation does build resilience within us. It, it does empower us to adapt and to be more flexible and to go with it and to be less irked and, and fractious and, and all of these things. Although that said, I experience all of those emotions as well. Of course I do. However, without the practice, I, I really don't think I could do the work and sustain the, the, the intensity of the work. Um, and I, I do believe that meditation helps to, to build community. And, and apart from it inspires people like myself and others around the world doing really good work like Judy and Paul Taylor, for instance, in, in Australia and, and others, you know, great people within our community. Um, it, on another level, meditation does raise consciousness. And I think it, it's playing its part in these troubled times in helping humankind to reach a critical mass. You know, and, and if we can reach a critical mass in terms of wanting to live in a more compassionate, altruistic way with each other globally and seeing each other as, as brothers and sisters all in one big human family. But you and I have also talked on, yeah, that's all happening, but we will encounter the shadow counterpart there will be resistance to that. And we are seeing that playing out now with this Black Lives Matter movement. You know, all of us within our community, I'm sure, have got every sympathy with people within that movement. But over this weekend, you know, there have been marches and demonstrations by the far right, you know, in London, places like Newcastle, you know, in Middlesbrough, you know, where, where I'm from, there are friends of mine, lads who I grew up with, who, who you know, they stayed on the path that, that, that I used to be on many years ago. And, and they're all part of right wing uh, groups like the English Defence League, or some of them are anyway. And they were out over the weekend guarding statues of Captain Cook, who, who's a local hero in, you know, in these parts from the so-called, the, the new enemy to them has become the so-called lefties. You know, anybody who's got a liberal perspective. So they were out standing like this in front of these statues. It's madness. It's madness. Look, it's, it's the shadow. We've seen it in America. We've seen it in the UK. I think it's all part of what has to, we, we've got to go through this. You know, it's, it's like a dark night of the soul, if you like. I, I do believe that humankind has got to experience this. We've got to purge the, these shadows. Um, we, you know, we've got to go through this period so that we do emerge, cleanse somehow, and, and ready for the line to lay down with the lamp. And, and, and live in a better way. And I, I do believe that our community, it's, we are playing our part every time we sit down to, to meditate. You know, we, we, we're doing our bit. And GM, for instance, within the Oblate community over in the Philippines, 
she's got a marvellous vision of, um, you know, the, this Monday morning gathering that we've had. It, is there a better way to start a working week than a, at nine o'clock every Monday morning? You know, this morning, the, you know, I looked on the Zoom, there were, there were 140 people or so from around the world all coming together in that one moment, focusing on our sacred word. That's a one hell of a force for good. Mm. And that's not including the people who watch it, you know, on other forms of social media afterwards and alongside of. So that's happening. Our community is playing its part. And when we come together, I, I think we become like a laser beam. We become much more effective. And th there are some great research papers on, on people who meditate and, and go into a state, run down the states, like what you saw in Middlesbrough. And the crime levels can come down. Hospital admissions can come down. And I think it, if, if you and I uh, align with the light, if we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, we only have to stand next to somebody at the bus stop and not say a word. And on some sort of level that we probably can't understand, that person will benefit just by being in the presence of that light. So I don't think we should ever underestimate the power of our community as a force for good in these turbulent times. Thank you. There are two things, uh, well, maybe one of the reasons that we can... Uh, We, we can have an influence standing next to somebody at a bus stop is that we may let them get on the bus before us if it's crowded. So, <laughs> well, there's that as well, yeah. Maybe, maybe, we're not perfect. But there are two things you haven't lost uh, despite the incredible intensity of your, of your work and of your life, really. And that one of them is humor and the other is hope. And many people would have, would have lost their sense of humor, being consumed with anger, with you know, righteous anger. Uh, and humor would have seemed a kind of a, a blasphemy against, against the suffering that you, you encounter. But you didn't lose your, your hope, your humor, and you certainly haven't lost your hope. You see this as a dark night rather than as a, you know, a kind of a, the end of the world. Um, but what would, there are two things I'd ask you, what would meditation without some commitment to social action, how would you explain that? Meditation without social uh, conscience, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, social action without meditation? Good question, Lawrence, good question. Uh, and I think in terms of the humour, it's probably because I come from Irish stock and we like a good crack, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, and it's important, isn't it? Because life can be hard enough and, and yeah. And, and sometimes the, the humour might be like a gallows type of humour and, and because it, it raises the spirit, doesn't it? You know, it, it, it's empowering. And so long as it, it doesn't damage anybody, I think it's important. But in terms of meditation on its own, you know, we don't want to just become nasal gazers, uh, gazers do we? You know, I like that idea of um, within Buddhism of the, the, the Bodhisattva, you know, the, the one who meditates, not just for our own liberation, but for the liberation of all. And so I, I do believe that meditation, and, and I've loved Sarah Bachelard's talks, for instance, on, you know, what, what, why don't you just meditate? Why, why do you need this Jesus thing? Um, you know, it just gets it away, doesn't it? I, I thought her series of talks were excellent because there is an added dimension. I think the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And for me, Jesus represents the, the Christ mind. And 
we, we are, you know, the, the Christ mind is, is cosmic, it's universal, it, it's all encompassing. Therefore, let's align with that. Because when we do align with that, that power flows through us. You know, we've had Pentecost lately and, and, and the image of the, you know, there were the disciples. Can you imagine back in the day, 2,000 years ago, they'd lost the leader. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd fled. There was only the women who, who stood around it and waited and, and showed a lot more courage than the, than the men folk. And something incredible happened that galvanized that same bunch of people into a, a force for good that went out to the point where, well, you, you'll know more, more than I, Lawrence, you know, most, if not all, ended up martyred. What happened? What was that mystery? And I think when we meditate, we get a sense of that because that same force for good comes through us. So I, I think when I meditate, my intention beforehand, if you like, is to align with, with that force for good, the Christ mind, and allow the Holy Spirit to remove anything that gets in the way, you know, the veils, the obstacles from me submerging into that. Because when I am in that presence, then inevitably I'm going to be much more useful in the world. If I don't have a practice such as that, then I'm just going to be an egomaniac. Mm -hmm. I'll be out there for fame and fortune. And there are people who use meditation in, in corporate situations and stuff who use and learn mindfulness and stuff so that they can focus the minds to earn more money or this or that and the other. So I, I think we, we can become too selfish if we don't have um, you know, a spiritual dimension to our work. Uh, and I think without it, yeah, if, if you, you can get bogged and, and lost in, in social action to the point where you become a, just as angry as the other people on the street. And, and you've seen that playing out in some of these demonstrations where there's people on the right, there's people on the left, they're all waving placards and they're all wanting to fight each other. That's ego-driven. And, you know, some of that has played out within Extinction Rebellion, I think. I, I think they are a good movement and they're doing good work in raising awareness and everything. But I think sometimes the message is lost. If, if you, you get too political, if, if, you, if, if you haven't got that centred um, connection that, and compassionate kind of drive that, that will bless your work, to use that phrase, empower and enable it much more effectively. We, we're much more forced, I believe we're, we're much more effective if we align with the light, mm. so to speak. And, and when I go back and I look at the gospel writings of Jesus, hey, don't, don't make a God out of me. Don't put me on a platform. You can do everything I can do. You just don't believe that yet. You, you haven't come to that realization yet. You know, and it's the Father working through me that's doing the work. It's not me as such. Mm. And that's exactly the same for any of us, every member of our community. It's the same for all of us. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And uh, it makes me realize you're, you're not just a contemplative in action, but you're a theologian in action as well. <laughs>